Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the vacuum transport seminar. This is the fifth edition in the semester today, and we're very welcome. Welcome to welcome. We're very happy to welcome all of you tonight. In the name of all the organization uh, organizations who are involved in the vacuum transport seminar. So we have two interesting talks today. We have we start off with uh, Olaf Dunkel and Florian Florian Kreck from Musira Hyperloop. Um, they're both students in electrical engineering at the um, Karl Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and they will talk about the safe and modular high and low voltage electronics architecture for Hyperloop pod prototypes. And as our second speaker, we are very happy to um, welcome um, Albert Schuster, he's the CEO and founder of Moya Design. And he will talk about the importance and the influence of design on the, in the mobility sector. Um, just as a short information again about um, the seminar, we use this tool called slido.com where we can all, well, where all the audience can post the questions that they have during the presentation. And then right afterwards, we will, like right after every presentation, we will go through the questions and um, discuss them with the speakers. Um, I will post all the information on that in the chat in a second. And we're very uh, looking forward to the presentations. And for a more detailed introduction, I would like to hand over to Daniel from the Eurotube Foundation who will give a brief insight and overview of our today's speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Natalie, for the, for the words. Uh, hello, everybody, also from my side. Very happy to uh, moderate today's uh, vacuum, tra vacuum transport seminar. As uh, you, Natalie, already mentioned, I would like to, to welcome our colleagues from UZERO. Uh, we had the opportunity to meet uh, last year and year, uh, this year during, year during the European Hyperloop Week. And they showed us their tremendous work, uh, which they have been carrying, carried out uh, 2021 with their levitating pot. Um, so I'm really much uh, looking forward to, to the seminar. As a brief overview um, of, of, the, of the speakers, Olaf Dunkel is co-founder and head of technology at MuZero uh, Hyperloop. Uh, he worked on a concept and design of a novel linear induction motor, and the motor control systems. And as a background, uh, he has uh, looked into motorsports uh, with simulation platform for autonomous vehicles. Uh, currently, he's studying electric and engineering and information technology at the KIT, as uh, uh, Natalie has mentioned. Also, from uh, Florian's uh, Keck side, um, he's uh, working since 2020, uh, also as a co founder of New Zero Hyperloop, uh, more as a lead uh, in electronics uh, division. Currently, he's also studying electrical engineering and information technology. And as a background, he's been looking into electronics integration and testing uh, in vehicles, uh, thanks to, to uh, uh, practicum by, by Porsche. So uh, without further dilation, I would uh, like to give you a word to you guys and uh, very much looking forward to the presentation. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Um, we're looking forward to and present some of our findings we had the, during our first season, Miss Hero. So we are Florian and Olaf from Miss Hero Hyperloop. We are really glad to be here. And th again, thanks for inviting us. And today we want to shortly present our association. And then also we want to focus on which concepts we implemented for our electronics and how these those concepts helped us to develop a fully functioning prototype within one year. Um, when we were founded during uh, the spring last year, we had several goals in mind. So first of all, we wanted to create or to uh, develop a platform for scientific exchange for future transport technologies, especially the Hyperloop concept in Karlsruhe and Baden-Württemberg, that's in Southern Germany. Um, but today we don't wanna focus on the propulsion and levitation system we developed uh, also during the first year, during the first season. And instead we wanted to focus on tools or maybe rather framework um, that we try to implement to enable a sustainable development of such a prototype in a student's association. And especially in the, um, uh, during the development of uh, our electronics system. But before going into detail regarding the technical developments, we want to start with our team, which has two members of a great and motivated team consisting of more than 60 team members um, from several nationalities placed in four universities in Baden-Württemberg and yeah, with, with, with different backgrounds and really glad um, to be such a, such a yeah, 
part uh, of the team. Looking back on uh, when we were founded uh, last year, um, we tried to set some goals because it, it was obvious that um, we can't build up the perfect system within one year. And so our goal was not to strive for high velocities of our first prototype. Instead, we wanted to develop a system and components that are modular and that are scalable. So that means that we can still use them uh, in, especially in future seasons of uh, Misuro Hyperloop developments. And third, that's maybe the, the most important point, and we also want to oh, talk about on that today, it's that all components and also the overall system is uh, designed in an inherently safe way that um, we do not face problems or we can detect all the problems and, and stop the system when there is an, an error. Um, before getting into the electronics, we want to give a short overview of the mechanics of our pod that you have like uh, some illustration. Um, uh, so basically the biggest and the heaviest component is our linear induction motor, which not only provides a thrust force, but also a um, levitation. And then we have an aerodynamic shell, a spatial frame, which uh, uh, ensures the structural integrity of the system with emergency landing gear, a guidance system, which guides the system in lateral direction. And last but not least, an emergency braking system, which uh, is actuated once there's a problem or once the linear induction motor uh, is controlled to brake as well. But if there's any problem, then the emergency braking system actuates. And hello, everybody. Also, a warm welcome from my side. I'm Florian, and I'm going to go a little bit more into the details of the techniques of our electronics architecture. So um, as you see in the picture above, electronic systems are distributed throughout the whole pod. Here you see our electronic control units marked, which are spaced everywhere throughout the pod and need to be connected somewhere to exchange data. We call the electronic system the nerve system and the brain of the pod because it's such a small component regarding volume and mass, but it serves so many important functions. Um, for example, we can subdivide electronics in the following components. At first, we need power. All uh, electronic systems need power to run that needs to be provided by a battery and um, be enough for the run uh, that there is more battery than the uh, runtime. Then we need wiring because all those components are distributed, their information and their power needs to be exchanged. And there need to be several guidelines like um, being electromagnetic compatibility because our linear induction motor produces not lots of electrical fields and magnetic fields, which might give some problems to the electronics if not treated properly. In addition, we have sensors that monitor safety critical parameters of the pod and ensure that the run can be done safely. And as well, they gather some useful data, which we can analyze after the run and improve future pod designs. Not to forget the hardware, electronic control units that do all the computation work and gather all the signals. There we also had some self-designed systems that manage all our tasks. Another component is the software. Nowadays, nothing runs without software. We also put in lots of work there. For example, um, we did a lot of embedded software. Um, to mention some tasks here is like the uh, sensor data fusion, the control of the pod, or the finite state machine that controls what happens when. Um, in addition, we have communication in the pod and uh, external. So in the pod, we need to exchange data. And externally, we need to connect to the ground station and for our remote operator to control the pod and to view all the critical data and make sure that the pod is running all fine. And uh, last but not least, basically the most important thing is safety. We needed to ensure that all systems work every time and not only most of the time, because for such a critical system, that's really, really important. And to give you some key figures, um, our pod in the end included seven electronic control units, 40 sensors, five actuators, 1,700 signals that are, were being exchanged between uh, communication partners, and over 14,000 lines of code. Um, before setting down um, and starting to develop something, we remembered our engineering guidelines and tried to face the challenges that current electronic development has. The first challenge that we identified is that electrical and electronic systems 
are nowadays mainly enablers for innovative system and subsystem development. So whenever someone has a new idea, he needs data to verify that. He needs control power to do the control for that. So electronic system need to be ready in advance and enable other departments to create new products and new components. Um, from that, we concluded that we need a modular, flexible and distributed system that could easily serve the requirements even of future pod generations. Um, the second challenge we identified is that uh, safety and reliable systems require proper engineering from the beginning on. So when you want to design something um, that's safe, that you trust, you need to start putting that effort in from the beginning of the process. You can't uh, test security into a product. It needs to be designed in. Uh, from that, we concluded that documentation, version control, and modeling is very important. So. Of course, we use the standard tools like Git to manage software versions. We had a wiki where all the information and concept and design were exchanged. And we used for critical components like the controllers or the state machine modeling techniques to ensure that every state is being safe. And the last challenge we identified, um, nowadays there's a steady increase in the complexity of electronic systems. And to handle that complexity, we require standardization and abstraction. Nowadays, systems are so complex that a single person can't understand it. So we need to have clearly defined interfaces and standardized ways to handle that complexity. And then we concluded that automation standardized, and standardized components are one of the major um, points there. And um, yeah, to summarize it, think what you want to do, what you want to achieve before you start doing it, then you have it very much easier in the end. Um, the first thing we standardized is our hardware. For all the electronic control units that do the data processing, we decided for a modular stack up concept. So here you see our basic control unit. It includes all the components that are needed on every um, PCB, and it can be extended by one of four different shield types that then serve the specific function. So for example, we have a power distribution module that distributes all the power in the pods. We got a module to control the brakes. We got a module to read sensors and process their data. And um, this really speeded up the development time because all the complex stuff, um, which you see visualized here, happens on the basic control unit, like microcontroller, clocking, power supply, communication. And it only needed to be done once and could then easily be reused for the other components. And by that way, we also speed up the development, uh, no, sorry, we reduce the potential for errors because the complex things had to be done once and correct, and then they could be reused. Um, yeah, and all those devices in the pod that are distributed everywhere need to be connected somehow to exchange their data and serve as an overall system. For that, we settled on the controller area network bus system which is standard in the industry, especially in automotive industry. And it's well supported. So you get the tools and everything you need for that. Um, but it leaves a lot of standardization and interpretation open to the user. So um, yeah, on the right, you see the OSI layer model. It um, defines some abstractions for handling complexity. complexity. And the CAN um, bus only defines the lower two layers. So the upper five layers are open to standardization by the user, or if it's standardized at all, will cause you lots of pain because everyone will do it differently. There will be no standardized way. So we went to develop our own protocol, which we call CAN0, and it exactly serves the functionality. It's a layer seven um, communication protocol that is well suited for an embedded network architecture like our Hyperloop pod, but it could be easily used in other areas. Um, for example, we extend the functionality of a standard canvas by automatically assigning the canvas IDs based on node IDs. We can transmit real-time data, which is critical for control systems and the braking system, for example. But we can also um, exchange service data. That means we can go from our telemetry station into all ECUs, change parameters before a run, or read back internal data, which can be really useful for debugging because embedded systems don't give you out much information um, because you need to save bandwidth and computation power. 
And then when something happens, it can be quite hard to get to the root cause of the error. And with our service data, we can do exactly that, um, access internal debug information when needed, and then uh, get to know, uh, to understand our system faster what happened. Also, we included node management, meaning like restarting and switching on and off ECUs, and a bootloader. So our whole pod is over the air update capable. Whenever we wanted to try new software during testing, we could just flash the software um, onto the pod um, from remote. And while doing all that, we ensured that we stay interoperable with standard Canvas and the standard tools you use. For example, Vector um, Informatic may be a company you could know. We can still use all of their systems. And to handle our protocol, we said we wanted a big focus on automatization. And therefore, we created our own tool chain package that handles the database. So update it, add new sensors to it. And one big part um, to also translate that database, which defines the communication, into code that can be executed by the ECUs. So whoever has done something with uh, communication before, and when trying to code it by hand, it can be a really a pain and is prone to errors. So that's why we automated all those processes that can be done once correctly and then reused by everybody. And in the end, this proved really useful because we had standardized ways to do it. We didn't um, make made errors there. And all communication is defined in a central database that can be accessed by anyone because we exchanged it via Git. And yeah, creating those protocols and the tool chain to handle it was clearly a lot of work, but in the end it really paid out because even team members who didn't have much experience before could use the systems because we abstracted the complexity for them. And in addition, speaking of software shortly, um, all our ECUs run software, which was written by us most of the time. Um, to settle standards here, as we are developing a complex system that is critical in safety, we're using a real-time operating system that can execute multiple tasks in parallel. And even here, we abstracted more. So if you look at our abstraction graph, we got a mega controller that runs the software. We got drivers by the vendor. We got an operating system on top of them. And only as the last step, the last small software blocks are the user tasks that each user writes for the breaks or the, for the sensors. Most of the software is standardized and can be reused. Um, yeah, we wrote it in a C++ and object-oriented way. And um, as I said, most of the software parts, for example, that handle communication over Canvas, the service data, and errors and warnings are automatically generated. Um, yeah. And last but not least, all the data needs to be presented in a nice way. For this, we got our telemetry system. We're using a web-based web -based interface, so everyone with a laptop can access it without the need to um, install any software. And as it is web-based and relies on a server, it also stores the data, which um, we can then visualize it after a run and um, yeah, analyze it to to create new designs. And in the end, we got on the right our parameter panel with which we could change all the parameters during the pod run, um, for example, to configure how long the pod should run or exchange control parameters, as now Olaf is going to talk about. Exactly, and maybe to underline this, um, this is a good example of how the software developed in our electronics team helped a lot to decrease the development time of our um, also propulsion high voltage systems. And that is especially true for the high voltage control unit, which used um, the hardware Florian was talking about, and also the software framework. But especially for the motor control system, it was really helpful. Uh, for example, during the testing, we uh, testing times we had, we could directly flash new software, we could update our software over the air, and that really largely decreased our development time. It was really helpful. But now coming to our uh, the, the second part of our presentation, the high voltage system itself, uh, maybe to give a short overview about that. Um, as already mentioned, we have a linear induction motor for propulsion levitation purposes, and that is controlled by the power electronics, uh, also including the motor control system. 
And yeah, the power electronics basically controls the power flow from the high voltage battery to the propulsion system. And then we also have an access panel, um, which uh, ensures or which enables that um, the high voltage system can be handled safely. For example, uh, it uh, includes a high voltage measuring point and a high voltage disconnect. <clears throat> uh, maybe uh, some, some figures, uh, our high voltage system has um, almost 600 volts, uh, a current of 150 ampere on DC side and 300 ampere on AC side with a <clears throat> maximum electrical power of about 60 kilowatt. Uh, but maybe to, to motivate again, um, um, or maybe considering those figures, it is obvious that it's a, a dangerous, dangerous system itself. It can easily kill people, um, one has to admit. And maybe to define first what means high voltage, high voltage means voltages of more than 60 volts, and those can be dangerous. So they can start to be dangerous from that voltage um, for, for human beings. And the high voltage system, or maybe also the interfaces, they were designed in a way that we can safely operate and safely um, design our system. To illustrate that a little bit, um, um, you can see here an overview of our high voltage system. So basically here, um, the battery and the power electronics with housing and here the linear induction motor. Um, but here it's, it's nicely visible that um, the battery uh, consists of uh, separated uh, uh, battery segments, which do not exceed 60 volts. Then we have here the battery uh, junction box, which includes all the ECUs that are required for monitoring and for controlling the whole high voltage system. And then here we have the power electronics um, with uh, the motor control system. And below those um, housings here, we have the linear induction motor, which is placed directly above the track. Um, and as already motivated, the electronics architecture definitely helped a lot to also develop parts of that. Today, we do not want to focus on the technical implementations of the high voltage system. Instead, we wanted to motivate and to explain a little bit um, how we implemented that we developed a safe high voltage system and how, what, uh, which approaches we took there. And first of all, um, we needed some administrative guidelines when working with and on high voltage systems. And first of all, we sensitized all of our team members, of course, especially those who were working with high voltage components. That included detailed risk assessments and also work instructions when working on those uh, high voltage components, as for example, the battery, um, which is probably was the most critical component. Then we labeled and um, all the components and we had warning lights whenever high voltage was active. We had a dedicated high voltage training, um, which, uh, uh, which was done by DECA, that's a European vehicle inspection company. And we can definitely recommend all people working on this kind of critical tasks to do such a training it was really helpful. And last but not least, we had a defibrillator. Whenever we worked with high voltage, um, the defibrillator was, was present um, and available. On a technical level, to maybe give a short overview, um, um, Basically, we were constantly monitoring all high voltage signals, but also uh, any other critical signal. And that um, this monitoring process also included the insulation monitoring device that was implemented in our high voltage system. Then we defined a dedicated emergency state that was used whenever any critical state was detected. And this emergency state also included an automatic discharge routine. That means once there was an emergency case, then uh, yeah, there was no high voltage present anymore outside of the battery housing. Then we, uh, of course, we uh, um, used redundancy, for example, regarding the voltage measurement. It was not possible to touch high voltage systems uh, during operation um, by covers and interlocks was that ensured. And yeah, that's, it was maybe a little bit more challenging, but the majority of our safety logic on the hardware uh, regarding the high voltage system was um, implemented on hardware and not on software. Um, but uh, of course, we also, before integrating our system into the pod, um, we tested the high voltage systems um, extensively. And maybe to give a short overview on that, we brought a, a small, small or short video clip. You can see <clears throat> the pre-charging process, the, the red light is blinking. You can see how voltage is active and now it's getting discharged again and the light is green again. So no high voltage active anymore. And yeah, as, um, as I said, this was ensured the functionality of those systems before integrating into the pod. And yeah, now we talked a little bit about the tech technical developments and maybe to sum up um, what um, like our, our pod at the end um, was able to achieve. And yeah, it was, 
yeah, actually we were not only able to achieve our goals and that was, we, we actually surpassed them. That was really great um, to see um, instead of uh, 50 kilometers per hour, we, we originally planned, we achieved 74 kilometers per hour. And yeah, we um, unfortunately were not able to um, show this at a European Hyperloop week. However, we are really satisfied with the results of the EHW and yeah, and um, instead we, we were able to have a, a further testing event in Munich and maybe at that point, thanks to, to, to Munich, maybe some, some guys are here, great thanks to them that we were able to use their test track in Munich. And yeah, even though we had more than 60 kilowatt electrical power, uh, maximum electrical power, our low voltage and high voltage systems safely handled this electrical power. Um, so our system stayed safe and in operation during all tests. And that was maybe the biggest achievement, maybe even bigger than the achievement of uh, yeah, achieving 74 kilometers per hour and uh, lifting up the whole pot uh, at some time. So to end up our presentation, we shortly want to show a video um, from our uh, tests in Munich again. Thanks a lot. Um, and afterwards, we are um, we're looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Olaf and Florian, for the interesting insight. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that was really a, a great moment, and it's always nice again to, to look into this video clip for sure. <laughs> Thanks. Perfect. Thank you so much for the interesting presentation, Florian and Olaf, and all the insight into uh, your Hyperloop team. Um, I just saw the audience was very active and there are a lot of questions. Okay. Um, I would say due to time reasons, I think we pick the most interesting ones, if you all agree on that. Sure. And so I would like to start with the first one. Um, so somebody would like to know, have you encountered EM interf interference on your control electronics? If yes, how did you manage to encounter it? What's the max B field you generate? Um, yeah, for sure. We tried to put in all these safety measures from the beginning on to avoid having problems there, like using differential signals, using current signals, uh, shielding all the high voltage cable, using star grounding, and um, don't create loops in current wires. Um, by using all those measures, we had already a, a good starting baseline and then only encountered some um, problems there, which could be solved by um, looking over all those things I talked about and improving them and making sure they are fulfilled. Then we didn't have any problems. Yeah. And what was the V-field? And maybe regarding the, the most important thing, actually, that we had uh, big problems, a lot of problems, but then we reduced like the, the, the distance of, um, of the components or of the um, of the grounding and reduce the impedance there and that helped a lot. And regarding the B field, uh, it was depending of course on the position um, in the air gap, we had uh, about uh, one, one Tesla or slightly below, below that. But um, regarding the lateral direction, it was not really critical. Um, it was ex as expected in simulations. So uh, we didn't have any problems because of B fields in the, in the ECUs. All right, all right. Then um, also a question with many upvotes is, please explain how you do the OTA. The over the air update, yeah. Um, so all our ECUs have an CAN, uh, an CAN bootloader that accepts new software over the CAN bus system we have in our pod. And we used an open source version here, it's called OpenBLT. Um, can really uh, recommend it to try it out if you're interested. And then we got one, um, computation node in the pod, which um, connects the CAN buses to our Wi-Fi system and wire that to the telemetry ground station. And from the telemetry, um, we upload new firmware, that just the generated um, binary files to the telemetry node, and it then writes the new software via CAN to the ECUs. And then we have just an, uh, an GUI where we can select flash this, this sensor node with that file, and then all the transfer and can ID and addressing is handled by our tool chain then. All right. 
Then the next question, is your embedded software real time? If not, what ensures the execution? Um, our software is real time. We're using an RTOS and real time operating system um, to make exactly that sure. And um, there are also watchdogs in software and in hardware to ensure if something would stuck that the pod would uh, do an emergency braking maneuver. Okay, then somebody would like to know, have you tested the sensors, batteries, et cetera, under vacuum? If yes, which type of challenges have you faced? Um, yeah, well, actually we did not test it because at the beginning we set some um, basic requirements and we decided to not include the vacuum requirements because they are also more and more complex to, um, to satisfy and so we didn't test them. Okay, and then I would say, um, as mentioned due to time reasons, we go for one last question. And it's about the, um, the limb, the linear induction motor. Did you do simulations to control the limb? How long did it take to achieve levitation and propulsion once you had it? How do you control switching in the limb? Um, so maybe regarding the, the sim, uh, we actually we started the first developments we had were um, the FEM simulations for the motor. So working on that in several months. Um, then regarding control, we, we used the power electronics or a bought solution of an uh, inverter and so the hardware was already existing regarding the switching of um, um, and then um, yeah but basically what we implemented were some software and so we included the mo model of the linear induction motor and had like for example the current controller and then also a controller which selected the appropriate operation points to to get a thrust force that was developed in-house um, also using the, the pipeline like this the software Florian was talking about and yeah, basically um, regarding levitation, maybe so our first, uh, again, uh, looking to our requirements. Uh, first, we wanted to de develop a system that is robust when it comes to uh, propulsion. And so we focused on that and levitation was not actively controlled, but we achieved the levitation at higher speeds because of the yeah, um, procedure like electrodynamic suspension principle. Uh, at the end, um, we achieved it by this principle that we lifted up um, but we didn't actively control the levitation, just the propulsion force. Okay, so once again, thank you very much, Olaf and Florian from Missouri Hyperloop, for your contribution to the vacuum transport seminar. It was a great pleasure to have your uh, your presentation, and thank you, thank you very much for for your talk. Thanks for your invitation. Thank you. So then I would like once again to head back to uh, Daniel to introduce our second speaker tonight and to give a short introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. Our second talk of today is coming from the CEO Albert Schuster from Moya Design. Uh, we had once again had the opportunity to meet during the European Hyperloop Week. It was a really good exchange. Uh, also, um, the presentation given there uh, was um, Pretty, pretty good. That was the reason um, I thought, okay, mate, let's uh, give him the chance also to present in the trans seminars. Um, from his background, maybe you have seen it already. Uh, he has already done a design study together in collaboration with Mu Zero, where uh, first uh, prototype of interior of Hyperloop uh, capsule is shown. Uh, without further dilation, I would give the floor to Albert so he can explain us more in this, uh, in this topic. Thank you for your introduction and thank you for the invitation. I tried to share my screen. I hope it works. So I suppose you can see my gray screen with uh, the header, right? Okay, and you can hear me well? Um, can't see it yet. Excuse me? We can't see it yet. It just says oh. it's starting the screen sharing. So it okay. might take a little. Yes, no, it's there. Okay, That's perfect. Good. Okay, so yeah, again, thank you for having me. Um, um, yeah, Moya Design uh, is Institute for Product Design, Architecture and Communication Design. And um, together with Mu Zero Hyperloop, we designed a Hyperloop pod. But before I show the pod and go through the different design decisions we took there, 
Um, I want to share a bit about our experience designing public transportation systems and also um, share a little thought about why we think design is important in future public projects and especially transportation projects. So generally today when people think about the future, um, a lot of people think about overpopulation, they think about um, um, about pollution, about limited natural resources, and probably you could even think about wars breaking out because of these reasons. Um, so a lot of people see the future in a negative way. Um, and if you look at this picture, that's Mexico City, uh, a city with 21 million inhabitants and still growing. That's probably one of the examples where you can say, yeah, that's really true what is happening on the world. Um, so a lot of people are afraid of the future, but I think most of the people who are listening right now are working on projects, on ideas that will make the future a better place. And of course, that's a good thing. And I think we should all together um, have this positive attitude because there was a time um, when, when thinking about the future as a positive thing was rather the standard and not the exception. And uh, that was a time when the world was really on the brink of being destroyed by atomic wars, by a cold war, and still people were thinking of the future as something good, as something positive. And I think that part of the reason why people were so, so hopeful about the future was because there were a lot of projects that were not only technically advanced um, and coming to life, but because they were also communicated in a way and designed in the way that was iconic uh, and was developed that way that people were really proud of it. So even people who, would, who were knowing they could probably never fly on the Concorde because, because it was too expensive, were still proud if this transport system was being implemented in their country and was being part uh, of their future of public transport. Um, so I think it's very important when, when doing a public transportation system, um, especially when doing it in, in democratic states, um, it not only has to be like accepted by the population, but it really has to be embraced and be desired because else you will probably not get it through all those regulations and all those um, different political um, steps you have to take to really implement a system. Um, and I think that is also true for the Hyperloop. So before I talk about the Hyperloop, um, I will talk about something that's quite like the total opposite of the Hyperloop. Uh, it's the cable car. It's compared to the Hyperloop super slow, um, but it already exists for hundred years. Um, it exists uh, in thousands of uh, systems that have been implemented. It has transported millions of people. It works, obviously. Um, and it is being used a lot in skiing areas and in tourist areas. But when it comes to using this system in cities, then it often is uh, implemented with, with a design and an aesthetic that is not suitable for the city. So what then happens is that a lot of people, even if this is in a, in a certain case, the perfect transport solution um, for a certain city and a certain location, people don't want to have this transportation system implemented in their neighborhood, in their city. And one of the first projects I did um, with a cable car um, was a project that was in Koblenz, the Koblenz cable car, uh, which was going to be built for only a temporary time to connect two parts of the city crossing a river. And there was a, a study being made um, regarding ecologic impact and also economic impact. And the cable car was definitely the most optimized transport system for this task. So after doing this study, the city decided to implement this system. And when the first technical drawings were out, people started um, yeah, uh, arguing against the cable car, protesting and not really accepting it. And that was when, when we came into, into place, um, designing the architecture and also 
um, the cable cars of the system. And what we then did was to, to try to find an aesthetic um, that really is something special and that stands out in the city and that makes this station and also the vehicle something very special. So it was built in the end and uh, it was a big success in terms of people taking this uh, transport system over the river. And then after four years, um, it was decided that it should be built back because that was the temporary kind of permit that was only um, that was only possible to receive with the city and all the other planning um, uh, systems that had to be uh, taken into account. So after four years, it was going to be built back. And then suddenly the population went onto the street to protest and to say, okay, we want the cable car to stay there. So that was a moment when we realized, okay, probably this special design had an effect on the people that they really embraced, not only the technology of getting quickly from one side of the river to the other one, but also because it was something special, something that added character to this part of the city. So in our further work um, in the cable car um, area, what we did was then with this experience, um, optimize cable car um, vehicles, trying to find a design that is suitable for the city that is timeless and that can compete um, with the design of buses and cars that is aesthetic and timeless. And that also in the interior can generate an interior where you can imagine this kind of transportation system being implemented in the city. And that means for us, a high quality design that has seamless details. And this is the roof of uh, one of the cable cars we designed and uh, where design is not only about aesthetics, but it's also about how you feel um, when you're uh, inside the station or inside the vehicle. So this is the roof, which is made of uh, acoustically absorbent materials. So when you are in this cable car cabin, you feel totally different just because the acoustic situation is uh, very much optimized compared to a standard cable car cabin. And then of course, uh, what is also important is uh, giving the, the consumer also additional benefits like charging stations for the smartphones and other additional elements. And this system we developed together with uh, Doppelmayr cable car manufacturing company um, is optimized that way that it can be um, it can be um, used as autonomous uh, transportation system in the city so you don't need any operator in the station and you can integrate it into the city with other public transportation systems. And going back to Mexico, which was uh, the first slide I showed, this system is now being introduced. Uh, in Mexico City. Um, in the beginning of this year, the Linea 1 has been taken into operation. And this system now connects two parts of the city where people who were commuting to work usually needed around two hours for, the, um, for this uh, length of the route. And now with the cable car, um, they only need 30 minutes. So that means if you take the whole commute going there in the morning and going back in the evening, that's uh, really a lot of time that you can save. And that again means um, a lot of comfort for the users. And it means that this city that is growing um, can function better because we have these additional transportation systems. So this is a system that is working today in a city um, and this is uh, like a real life experience of public transport and if we think about the hyperloop now um, then you might think okay so a cable car and the hyperloop um, what is the one thing and the other thing they're so far apart so what can you take from one project to the other one and when we started working with Muzero on the hyperloop project um, we asked these questions ourselves, of course, um, also because we thought, okay, the interior of a cable car 
Um, you think of it rather as a short distance um, travel vehicle and not like the Hyperloop where you can travel hundreds, if not thousands of kilometers. So then we thought, okay, probably the interior um, of a Hyperloop should rather look like a plane because of course you think of long distances and automatically you think of a plane. Um, but when you think about how much time you will spend in a Hyperloop, which can be pretty short, um, probably you just have a 15 minute trip um, going from one city to the next city, then probably um, you rethink this approach and uh, you think, well, probably the Hyperloop will resemble more a subway than a plane because the travel times will be rather closer to the ones on a subway line than the travel times you have on a plane. Even, even if it's a short connection in the plane, the Hyperloop will probably be even quicker. So after realizing that the Hyperloop Will will be a different um, will be a different vehicle experience than a plane. We started thinking about totally different ways of arranging uh, the seating layout in in the hyperloop pod, and of course taking into account that we have a small diameter so that the tube can be the smallest possible. And we thought of very different ways of uh, uh, using the space. But in the end, what we came up is uh, with a system that has two different parts in the pod. One is the part in the back, which has a rather traditional seating layout with uh, two seating rows, an aisle and a single seating row. And then we have the front part of the pod, which has a more, um, more spacious, more comfortable seating layout. And in the middle, we have the access um, element with the door. And we also have the toilet in this section, which um, is basically the, the border between the left and the right space. In the interior, um, we designed a seating concept where we have a seat that is the same seat on the back part of the pod and the front part. Um, and which can be used uh, seamlessly so that you have the same experience. But of course, in the front part, you can use better the comfort function when lying down uh, in the seat. And then we added a portion on the back and on the front additionally to have some additional space for luggage. I think I'll explain that later. Um, now you can see the pod fully filled with passengers and how it would look like on the platform in the station. And this is basically the view um, in the station. You have the tube. We decided that the tube is basically closed and we have three different doors that can open up to the pod. So basically, how it works is uh, this way. You have passengers coming onto the platform and walking um, to this area here, which is the waiting zone for people who are going to enter the pod that is coming to the station. But before they get to the, um, I don't know, you can see my mouse. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Before you go to the waiting area, you pass by this automated luggage box where you can put in your luggage. Um, and when you go over here, you can already see that the box is there, but you're already separated from your luggage if you have bulky luggage. Then the pot arrives and people from the pot get out of the pot. And at the same time, the automated luggage box, which was inside the arriving pot, drives outside of the pot autonomously. And the other luggage box, which was filled before by the passengers who will get into the pod, drives into the um, pod. So that means we have an exchange of luggage that is very quick and people can get on and off of the pod without having to handle their bulky luggage. So the idea that was that we could minimize uh, standing times of the pod by accelerating the 
entering and exiting of the passengers. So they can only take with them like a small uh, suit, uh, basically a small uh, bag where they probably have their laptop inside. But for people who are traveling for a longer period of time and have some bulky luggage, they put it in this automated um, luggage box. And so the exchange of this luggage is no problem and people can go inside and sit down and uh, the pod can start quickly after people entering the pod. So this exchange of these luggage pods would look something like this. They would autonomously drive out and inside and you could do that on the platform. So it wouldn't be like in an airport where you leave your luggage far away and then there's a big system that goes through the whole airport, but it would be a compact building because you would have this uh, luggage claim basically on the platform itself. Then we again thought about traveling in the plane and um, we thought, of course, in a plane, you can get some drinks, you can get something to eat. So wouldn't that be a service that you also want uh, in a Hyperloop? But then again, we thought um, having probably short travel times, there's not enough time for, for someone to get off after acceleration and uh, bring drinks and uh, food to the travelers. So we thought that is probably in most of the cases not a viable way for people um, to get drinks and food. So thinking again back to the, to the subway topic, we thought, okay, how is it solved in subways? Well, usually you have vending machines on the platform, but um, of course we don't want people to spend a lot of time on the platforms. We want them to get to the station and seamlessly get onto the pot and minimize travel time. So we don't want people waiting on the platform and using vending machines. But we thought probably we could have a vending machine that is inside the pod. Um, but of course, if we don't want people to walk around in the pod all the time going to the vending machine, then the vending machine has to go to the travelers. And that means basically um, having a little robot um, that is the vending machine and has everything in its belly and can serve you um, whatever you wish. So, um, we have basically service at your place, um, but with a robot. And we have seen a lot of um, different Hyperloop studies and a lot of them try to, to, to have some screens on the sides, um, trying to, to mimic the view you have from a train or a plane um, and, and uh, showing you a picture of, of the environment passing by. And in the beginning of the design, we also thought of using this element so that people don't feel um, too, too enclosed in this small vehicle. But then we thought on the one hand, if we would really show how quickly uh, you were driving, probably that would be too fast. So you would have to have some decelerated image of passing by um, the environment. And then we thought it's, it's really not true. So why not try to make this, this space comfortable and relaxing um, without having these like fake windows. So we decided we would rather go for having a space that probably changes the color with the light um, in certain time steps so that you have this um, kind of feeling that something is changing, but um, still the overall environment gives you a calm feeling um, and tries to brighten up the space with these light effects. Yeah, and those were the thoughts that went into the um, design of the Hyperloop pod. And hopefully soon we can all um, board on one of those and be in Berlin in 15 minutes. So that's it from my side. Thank you very much, Albert Schuster, for the very interesting and yeah, very insightful presentation with all the nice animations. And I think that's very nice futuristic insight for all of us.
where especially the Hyperloop teams are dealing a lot with the current technologies and the, the implementation. And it sounds very nice to see where this will be going and how it will then look like. So this is always very nice to see and have an insight. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to head over to the, to the questions. The audience has again been quite active. So I would like to start with the first question. And it is somebody would like to ask, um, did you consider aerodynamic simulation in your, dis in your designs? So we um, basically what we did was we did um, concentrate more on the interior design and on the on the topic of how get people inside the port and outside the port on the platform. So the overall form has been discussed with Mu Zero, but it's not like a hundred percent optimized aerodynamically. So that would be a rather kind of no answer. <laughs> All right. All right. But do you think it will be possible to implement that in the future? What is your opinion on that? Yeah, I think that would not be a problem. Um, I mean, basically, it's it's the front and back end of, of the pod, as I would see it. So I think it would not be a problem to, to implement an, an aerodynamic optimization of the pod, yeah. That sounds very interesting. Then um, another question with quite a lot of upvotes. Um, how much did you consider the safety factor aspect in the design of the Hyperloop cabin? Um, well, the, it was not so much about safety. I think um, there was a question we where we said that would be something that we would implement in a further design development. Um, I think we also discussed about what happens when when a pod stops in between, not at the station and so forth. And um, at that moment, we thought we're not that far with the whole package, also technically of the pod that we can really seriously discuss these topics. So that was not so much of a topic that we uh, included in the design decisions at that moment. Yes, I see, I see. Um, then we have sort of a follow-up question on that. Um, maybe it was already answered by your previous question, but I, I still want to, to ask the question. It's a question in the chat. And the question is, um, what, are, what are the current requirements for pod evacuation? Um, how many people will have to be evacuated in what amount of time in case of an emergency? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I'm not sure if I can answer that question, but I think there there's no regulation right now, right, about how far how quickly that would go. Um, but for example, when when you see the the luggage box on the back, we discussed that probably if the pot stops in the middle of the um, in the middle of the track somewhere in nowhere, basically, how can people go off? And then that's the question. Um, do people have to get off at that certain situation? And then would they have to get off by going through the back or the front? So would you need a door, an additional door at the front or at the back of the pod? Or would you have a safety system where you could say, okay, the pod can always continue with slow speed to some kind of, uh, to some kind of exiting point on the tube track where you can go out of the pod through the normal door? Um, so I think these are questions that not only depend on the pot design, but rather on the overall tube design and safety system. Um, yeah, so I think you have to really see that as the whole system and the pot itself cannot be the solution. Like that's the difference to the plane where you can say, okay, the plane can basically when it, it has landed on land or water or whatever, you can always open the doors and be outside. I think that's the difference with the Hyperloop that you always have to see the vehicle and the tube as a system. Um, so it makes the whole thing a bit more uh, complicated. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Then another interesting question um, also regarding your other work. Um, what are the main challenges while designing the cabins for Hyperloop vehicles compared to the airplane? To the airplane? Oh, we didn't design an airplane yet. So <laughs> we, 
but um but um i think um regarding compared to the cable cars that we did of course it's really hard to compare that because um in the hyperloop we're still in a very conceptual kind of um um design stage while in the cable cars that are really being built we're already in very very detailed questions um also regarding fabrication for example so um i think that is one topic that i suppose currently with a lot of designs that you see in hyperloop has not been addressed like optimization regarding um production uh, which then when when a vehicle is really being produced is of course a big topic you know how you can produce and optimize also regarding cost um the overall design yes i see so and then um i would say we do one last question it's quite an open question but i think it's very interesting because we're building this Hyperloop com community and fostering this community here with this seminar. So um, somebody would like to know up to which extent are you open to doing conceptual designs for Hyperloop stations for other teams, sometimes in hubs? <laughs> well, we're always open to <laughs> we're always open to doing interesting uh, work. So uh, yeah, just. Uh, just send me an email and uh, we can discuss that, yeah. That sounds very good. So I would say we take this as a closing note and I would like to thank again in the name of all the organizing organizations. I would like to thank again the two talks, so the three speakers today, Olaf and Florian from Museo Hyperloop and Albert Schuster from Moya Design. Thank you very much for all your insights and your and sharing your experiences and your contribution to the seminar. Um, we see each other again in a week for the next seminar. And until then, we wish everyone a nice evening and have a good week and see you soon. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. See you next week. Bye. Next Thanks week. for the talks. Thank you.